Okay, next we have Kyle Dalton from Penn State University here to talk about using flying disks to teach people about signal processing. Hello everyone, my name is Kyle Dalton. I'm a PhD student in the graduate program in acoustics at Penn State University. And in this presentation, we'll be looking at the sounds a flying disc makes as it passes through the air and how we can use these sounds to teach introductory signal processing concepts. In this talk, I'll use the phrase flying disc quite a bit. A flying disc is simply a more general term for a Frisbee, which is actually a trademarked product name. So why are we looking at flying discs in acoustics? Well, when I took my first acoustic signal processing class, we used many real world data sets, including recordings of firework displays, aircraft, and race cars. These data sets were great, but their sound sources were not readily available, and the collections themselves were not easily repeatable if a student wanted to explore their own data, or a professor wanted to change up the data set from semester to semester. Uh, in addition to being a student, I play a lot of disc golf. It's a sport that shares many of its rules with golf, except you play it with flying discs. And if someone throws a disc past you, you can hear it. So I thought, why not try to combine my interest in acoustics with my interest in disc golf and create a disc-based data set? Sports like disc golf and ultimate frisbee are more popular than ever, and whether you've tossed a flying disc for a pet or played one of the many frisbee-based lawn games that are out there, odds are you've thrown a disc at some point. Flying discs are cheap, readily available, and highly familiar, making them an ideal candidate for educational experiments and demonstrations. In this experiment, I set up three microphones in a straight line, 25 feet apart from one another. I then threw disc golf discs past the microphones to record the sound of their flight. At first, I tried recording without modifying the disc at all, and it worked, but I found that to get high quality data, I needed to throw very close to the microphones. Uh, the acoustics department was nice enough to loan me the microphones for this work, and I didn't want to risk hitting one with a disc. So I needed a way to make the disc louder. And ultimately, I found that taping a small whistle to the top of the disc made the disc loud enough that I could put a little more airspace between it and the microphones. The whistle was also small enough that it didn't seem to noticeably impact the flight of the disc. These three microphones are each attached to their own signal conditioner. Uh, these signal conditioners provide power to the microphones and help amplify the recorded signal. Then the signal goes to an analog to digital converter, which converts the recordings to a format that I can read, process, and store with my laptop. Now let's take a look at some flying disc data. This graphic is called a spectrogram, and it's a tool used a lot in acoustic signal processing. It helps visualize what frequencies are present in a recording and how those frequencies change over time. On this spectrogram, yellow and white areas indicate that there is more sound present at that frequency at that time. So let's take a listen. You'll hear the disc whistle by and then hear two thuds as the disc hits the ground. There are many useful skills that can be taught via this experiment. For example, we can look at designing filters to remove signals that might be present that are not disc related, like this kinglet call. Ultimately, I hope that by creating an engaging experiment, by having students throw the discs, record the discs, and then process the data, that it helps them better relate features in the data with the physical causes of those features. For example, these vertical features occur each time the whistle spins around to the leading edge of the disc, and by counting these features, we can determine the disc's forward velocity and rotational velocity. And I hope that because the student was actively involved in throwing the disc and recording the disc, that they have a better intuition of what these features are when they look at the spectrogram. The initial results look promising. Based on data from a single microphone and data from multiple microphones, I can tell how fast a disc is moving and how fast it's spinning. So what's next? I plan to take the experiment to my teammates on the Penn State Disc Golf Club. They have a lot of Frisbee experience, but pretty much no acoustics experience, which should make them the ideal group to test step-by-step -step instructions that anyone coming into an introductory signal processing class can follow. I'd like to explore making the experiment cheaper, easier, and safer. For example, I'm pretty confident in my throwing ability, and I manage not to hit any equipment with a disc. But if this experiment is going to see wider use, safety measures should be in place that catch any stray discs before they can hit a mic, laptop, or passerby. Uh, the discs are pretty cheap, but the recording equipment is not. I think it'd be interesting to try this experiment with just a USB microphone or even a cell phone mic to get the cost as low as possible. Finally, I'd like to compare my measurements with other sensors that measure velocity or spin rate, like a radar gun or high-speed camera. 
A disk golf company has developed a gyroscope based tool that attaches to the underside of a disk to track many of its in-flight parameters. Getting one of these sensors could make for a great comparison with my acoustic measurements. And with that, I'd like to thank the Penn State Graduate Program in Acoustics for lending me the equipment used in this work and my teammates on the Disc Golf Club for letting me use their action shots for this presentation. Uh, my email is on the slide if you'd like to reach out to learn more about this work or just to talk about Frisbees. Thanks. All right, wonderful presentation, Kyle. Um, as a former Ultimate Frisbee player, I would have loved to have this in my physics classes. So um, we have one question already for you. How successful have you been integrating this into the curricula at Penn State? Would you adapt it for undergrads versus grad students in any way? Yeah, great question. So integration into the curriculum is sort of a long-term goal. Where we're not quite there yet. Um, this was kind of a, a side project that I would do when I got home after uh, you know a full day of my normal PhD research. So um, hopefully this is the first step towards getting it integrated into the curriculum. Um, at Penn State, we're all only grad students for the time being. So the thought is that this would be something that could go in the introductory kind of first year grad student signal processing class. Great. Um, Avery asks, have you thought about using objects with more complex flight paths, such as boomerangs, in honor of this conference, maybe? Well, no, I hadn't considered boomerangs, but I mean, if it's the same, well, I, at least on the surface, it seems like it's kind of the same spinning object. Um, I'm sure there's more nuance to that, but that could be really interesting. Yeah. Um, a question from myself. Did you encounter any unexpected challenges when trying to implement implement this um, experiment? Um, I think finding the balance between making the disc loud enough to hear it um, consistently and and not impacting its flight was was challenging. Um, one of the things I tried was uh, taking like a like a paint stick and putting it on top of of the disc and the hopes to sort of create like a little miniature helicopter. Um, but that that did not work. It made the disc fly very erratically. Uh, so the whistle ended up being the best the best way to go. And another question for myself. Um, would it be possible to put the microphones closer together so that someone who's not as strong as throwing as you are might be able to um, throw the disc across all the microphones? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are some like signal processing uh, limitations that come as you start to move them closer and closer together. But I think that's definitely worth exploring, especially if you wanna make this as accessible to as many people as possible. Great. Um, we probably have time for one more question. Okay, Kita asks, do you think this physics lesson could actually lead to learning more about the sport of disc golf? Ooh, I hope so. Um, it's it's a at least in the United States, it's it's growing faster than it ever has. Um, so yeah, if anybody um, wants to learn more about about disc golf or any frisbee based sport, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to talk. All right. Well, thank you so much for answering these questions, Kyle. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of frisbee fans in the audience just ready to send you an email. So. Um,